And welcome to season four of Real Menopause Talk. My guest today is Dr. Luanne Brizendine, Professor of Neuropsychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, founder of Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic, author of The Male Brain, The Female Brain, and The Upgrade, the last of which is the most positive and fascinating read about peri to post menopause or the transition and the upgrade as it shall hence be known. If you've ever wondered exactly why the changes of mood happen during your cycle, strong one day and crying at the news the next, and then what happens once your cycle comes to a final end and you reach menopause or the upgrade, Luan has all the answers. In this episode, we discuss attention span and focus, irregular periods, what happens and why they occur, what happens when we sleep and how to get more of it, sensitivity to heat, and some arguments for and against HRT. We also discuss my coffee habits. Hi, Harry. Dr. Luanne Brizendine, I am so happy to meet you. Thank you. I've just finished reading your book recently, and it is the most positive thing that I have read about this phase of life. So to start off with, for everybody listening, would you mind telling everybody a little bit about yourself? So where you live, where you grew up, and how you came to do what you're doing? You know, I, I live in California. I was born in Kentucky. I grew up in California. I spent time uh, living in London and living in Paris and mostly, and then all of my education is on the East Coast of the United States. I went to, uh, I went to UC Berkeley and I did my undergraduate work in neurobiology, which is where I learned about hormones and behavior from all of the, uh, all of the great professors there. And then I went to Yale Medical School to do my, my MD and my medicine. And then I went and spent a couple of years at UCL in London doing um, history and philosophy of medicine and psychiatry there before I went back to Harvard to do my residency and my internship. And also my first faculty job was there before I got recruited out to San Francisco at UCSF, where I then started the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic, which I've been running for, for had been running for many years. And that's where I learned firsthand about all of the things we women go through with our ups and downs of our hormones. And that clinic mostly treated perimenopause and menopause women. So for the last 30 years, that's what I've been doing. And that's how I got interested in writing this book is after I went through it myself, I wanted to then teach and get make it available for all the stories. As you know, the book right has lots of stories in it. Yes. You can understand how other women have adapted their lives or followed your various protocols, which is terrific. And that is a phenomenal list of credentials. So knowing that you are through the transition and in the upgrade, how was it for you? And how did all your knowledge help support your transition? Well, as you know, I wrote about my own story too in the book. So I tell, I tell all my own secrets in there, all my own tricks for, for what I went through. Cause everybody is so different. You know, every, we're all individuals in terms of how you go through it. And I don't use the word perimenopause and menopause, as you know, in, in the book, because, you know, those are actually just little medical diagnoses, perimenopause and menopause. So that's why I call it the transition years and then the upgrade, because that's the whole woman approach. That's all of us. Those other kind of medical words, they don't, they don't capture all of us and what we're going through in our in our lives and our relationships and our and our you know all the other important things about us that are not just that diagnosis. So that's why the um, the transition word I used instead of perimenopause and upgrade instead of like menopause. So in my forties, I started going through the kind of rock and roll of ups and downs of the <laughs> of the you know the drooping around of your hormones and like is this really me? Am I turning into a complete B word, you know, or am I, am I always this irritable? Is my sleep ever going to return? Or I'm, you know, am I having this brain fog that's ever going to go away? And, you know, you have that feeling sometimes that you're in constant PMS. Mm -hmm. So because I knew about it, because I treat it in my clinic all the time, I had all kinds of tools in my toolbox that I used to, to help myself get through those various stages. So I really believe the role of a doctor, the role of people like me, if you come, if you came to me, Hattie, 
I would get to know you a little bit, understand what's important to you. And then I would try to make available to you all of the tools in the toolbox that I thought might be helpful to you. And then what we would do is we would start to test drive those for you, you know, just so that you have your own experience. And then we can see what effect it has because Mm -hmm. we need to know, you know, step by step what the effects are for you. That is one of the questions that comes up time and time again. What is best? But I think you've kind of answered it there in that it's what is best for each individual. So taking the tools, test driving them, see what works, keep that. If there's something that doesn't work, drop it, change it, do something else because there are multiple tools. So that the listeners who haven't read your book yet, and I will urge everybody to read it, for those who haven't read it yet, Can you tell us a little bit about the science behind some of the changes and what is happening neurochemically? Because that's something that I found particularly interesting. Hormones are talked about quite often, almost as an individual entity, but they come from the brain. Can you explain that to everybody? Yeah, isn't that cool? And I like the phrase that biology is destiny, unless you know what it's doing to you. Right. (laughs) Okay. So let's do a little nerdy deep dive into what's going on in kind of like how this female brain that we all have kind of goes through this life cycle. And these are, you know, this developmental stage that we call transition into the upgrade that we're Mm -hmm. talking about. So the day one of bleeding is the first day of your period. It's called day one of the cycle. So during day one and then gradually, 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 day one, two, three, four, five, up to about day 10 of your cycle and you start making more and more and more estrogen so that there's this huge outflow of estrogen like two or three days before ovulation. That's how mother nature made it because remember the purpose of a hormone is to cause a behavior. So the purpose of a hormone is to cause a behavior. If you're hungry, hunger hormones make you want to eat. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If you know, if you have a lot of sex hormones, they're going to make you want to have sex. So that, increase a huge increase a few days before ovulation of your estrogen and your testosterone in women makes you horny or want to have sex but all the studies show interesting things it makes us sway our hips a little bit more it makes us more talkative and actually we talk in a slightly higher voice and it makes us like maybe wear sexier clothes a little more makeup a little more jewelry whatever it is we kind of like you kind of like you know we get ready. Mother Nature's job for us women in those few days before ovulation is that we're supposed to be out there in the world seeking the best sperm. So we're out there hunting for the best sperm, ladies, just the last <laughs> few days in the world. So then, you know, that that has a big that has a big influence. I just I use that as a, how your behavior comes. And then after ovulation, then when all the progesterone starts in the last two weeks before you start to bleed again, the next cycle, all of these connections that are made in your brain all over the place, all your brain is connecting with other little connections, then it's like throwing weed killer on those connections, the progesterone like kills off all those connections that the progesterone just built up. And your your everything is being torn away and torn down all of those connections until you get to that horrible drop like 24 hours before, where most women feel that we call it in my clinic, the crying over dog food commercials. <laughs> I love that. And so accurate. You know, the boohoo or, or, or you get so irritable, you're everything your significant other does feels like fingernails on the chalkboard. Usually something he does that um, I'll know you will be like, oh, well. And then on those day, that day, it will be like, oh, I can't stand him anymore. Just get out of here, <laughs> you know, or whatever fight starts to happen, you know, that irritability happens. So that feeling of being jerked around by your hormones has to do with connections in your brain that are both built up and then torn down and built up and torn down and built up and torn down every single cycle during our fertility years. So ladies, that's what's going on under your hood, in your brain. And then the cool thing is, once you get to the upgrade, you're not having these things torn down and build up, torn down you're at a very stable, steady, eddy place where you can just be firmer, you have more clarity of thought, your brain fog goes away. You, you know, you have all, you just, you're not being jerked around every day of the month with building up brain circuits and tearing them down by your hormones. 
That sounds like such a joy. I'm in, I would say, mid towards late transition. And the symptoms have days where they definitely try to kick my ass. Brain fog, anxiety, all the, the classics, frankly. So the idea of having clarity of thought and a bit of peace is phenomenally appealing. Does this begin towards the end of the transition or do you have to be fully into the upgrade? So, you know, you might have some months as you're getting close, which I call the late transition before you get to that first stage of the upgrade, the late transition, you can have some months where you're not ovulating at all. So you're not having the progesterone tear everything down and build everything up. So you get some months that will be better than others. Mm -hmm. Are you getting those yet? Occasionally? No. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, no, no. So you're so it's helpful. So it's helpful that you'll be in there, in there, getting, getting those. And so, so yeah. So you know that the, the length of your cycle is the length of your cycle um, shortening a little bit from what it was in your thirties. It's incredibly variable. It will go from anything from, I mean, it's been as short as 11 days to as long as 36 days. It's going through a slightly more settled phase now, but it, it's very variable, a little shorter on the whole. So that basically means like those 11 day cycles that meant you didn't, you don't ovulate that month. You know, you're not ovulating. So if you don't ovulate, you don't have progesterone. So just real, real if you don't ovulate, you don't have progesterone, which is a whole other thing. But that, that means that the lining of the uterus builds up with more and more blood and doesn't shed all the blood sometimes that month. And then the next month you may have that thing I talk about called flooding. Mm -hmm. You get flooding sometimes where you I walk have out done. the house with oh, I Tom packs and yeah, and going to the bathroom every 40 minutes as a maximum to to rechange everything. Like I talk in the book about like, you know, just like when you go to anybody's house, you like double pads, double pads, double super tan packs or whatever. Yeah, And then some, yeah, extra, extra, extra everything. And then quite often that will lead to a shorter cycle afterwards. Yes, right, because you're, you know, basically you're not ovulating in those months. And so the progesterone isn't, isn't, progesterone will, uh, you know, stop the bleeding and then have the shedding go in an organized fashion. So mm -hmm. lots of times we'll put people on some extra progesterone because you're not making any to kind of keep the, keep that heavy bleeding down. You definitely, you need to have a little extra iron in your diet during yes. these months because the last, you know, the last four or five months of your, of this transition, you really don't want to become anemic because that'll give you low energy and low low oxygen to your brain. And you don't need that. You need every little bit of extra power you get, right? Absolutely. Every little ounce really makes a difference. There are two things. First of all, caring less about the needs of others, which sounds awful. It's as though you don't care. What I mean is putting yourself a little bit higher up the priority list, which is something we've talked about quite a lot on the podcast as something that we should do. And then also focusing on one thing at a time. When I was in my 20s, I used to have to listen to three conversations at once and I could, and I could remember what was going on. Whereas now uh, there's not a rat's chance in hell. It is one conversation at a time. And I may even need to take notes. But this is all part of the process. So why does this happen? So there's a lot of changes that go on in our in our brain circuits during this transition between age 40, 50, and 60. And you know, this it was kind of a fallacy that this multitasking thing that we all thought that we could do so well, whatever, because you know, there's just two hemispheres in the brain, the one, the left and the right. So even when you're in your 20s and 30s, if you're, you can only really hold two things in your mind at once, one in one hemisphere and one in the other. As soon as that third thing came, you would have to drop one. The other one would drop and you would just like, you know, where to go, whatever. That's why taking notes is good. But then as we get into this transition period, you basically can really only hold one thing in your, in your brain at once. And if another one comes, you drop the other one. You get distracted. Do you find that happening now? Yes. <laughs> All the time. So, so just understanding that, I think it's really helpful to know mm. that that if anything distracts you, it's like then trying to get back to what you were thinking about or what you're doing before becomes becomes harder. And that's just a natural part of this. But it also has a positive side to it, which is you know you just you give yourself permission to focus on that one thing that you're doing and get it done right then. Because you know you may not remember to circle back to it later. So 
then you learn to tell others, like when you're focusing on something to get it done, if somebody else wants your attention or something, which is always happening, you have to say, okay, I can do that in just a let, minute. Let me finish this first. So that phrase needs to be part of your toolbox. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me finish this first. Okay, let me finish this first. Okay, I can do that. Let me finish what I'm doing first. Let me finish this first. That's going to become your, that's going to become your best friend. Let me finish this first. So sleep is arguably one of the most important things because as I'm sure everybody knows with a bad night's sleep memory goes out of the window at any time of life and feeling good your hunger hormones change all sorts of things one of my favorite parts of your book was your sleep protocol can you share a few of your favorite bits with the listeners of course, yes. And I think is that I call it Luann's sleep plan. I think it's on page 82. Is that you probably I see your book over there in the background. So like, oh, it's like yes. people can look, look it up called. I think yeah, it's exactly. page 86. So, 86. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah, so page, page 86, ladies, 86. So this, it gets, it's a whole thing about 86 about Luann's sleep plan. Let me tell you the important thing just to keep in mind in terms of kind of the biology of sleep. I like the analogy of a three cornered stool for like the stability that we have in our lives and our health and our well being. It's like, a, it's like a stool and it has to have these three legs to be steady and stable. And those legs, and we're going to talk about all three of them, the first leg to be steady and keep everything steady is the, the one stool leg is called good sleep. The other one is the, the good nutrition and the other one is the good muscles and exercise. So those are the three. So the sleep is first, though, and I'll tell you why the sleep is so important. Without that one, you don't get any of the others. They, they all need each other. You can't, you can't do without any of them. So... In the brain, the very cool thing to keep in mind is that in the brain, all day long, our neurons, our neurons and brains are talking, talking, talking to each other. And they're, they, as they talk, 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 they, they throw away all this trash, they, all these things called proteins that they're making while they talk. It's like just throwing trash all over the place. And at nighttime, what happens is our neurons in our brain kind of shrink back from each other because they're not talking to each other. They shrink back. And in between is this little space where basically the brain uses that little space to come out and hose out all the trash. So all the garbage gets hosed out. It's kind of like those little machines in Paris on the, you know, those little green machines. They go around, they hose out all of the, all the, all the garbage out of the gutters. But anyway, we need all of our gutters between our brain cells hosed out every night so that we can wake up refreshed in the morning. Otherwise there's other sticky proteins, all throughout trash thrown all over your brain. So that's why we must get sleep every night, ladies, is to clean out the garbage, hose out the garbage. And there's some very simple ways to do this. The way we live our lives and the self-care that we don't even know we're not doing is something to think about. Okay. One thing are, are called psychostimulants or stimulants. And our biggest stimulant that most of us use in our life every day is caffeine. Do you take any caffeine, Patty? I have two double espressos every morning. <laughs> Your poor brain. <laughs> every morning. Anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. So for people who are having trouble sleeping, let me just give you the basic principles and then you can learn to modify and, you know, it's, uh, these are all goals. These are aspirational goals that we're talking about. So I know it doesn't <laughs> happen just all at once, but. Just for starters, caffeine is the enemy of sleep. Caffeine is the enemy of good sleep. And caffeine lasts in your body. If you have a cup of coffee at 11 o'clock in the morning, it's still in uh, still a certain percentage of it in your body and brain at midnight. Wow. So it lasts for a really, really long time. It's called the half-life of caffeine. And we women tend to, we, we tend to hold on to it longer, et cetera. So, just know that something you're going to be drinking at 11 in the morning is still going to be in your body 12 hours later, 11 p.m. to midnight. Okay, that's a basic principle. So what can you do? There's many things that we all can do. Maybe if you have your double espresso first thing in the morning when you wake up and then switch to decaf then mm -hmm. by that point. So there's other, you know, just but, but your, your goal, your ideal goal, if you're really a person who has a lot of trouble with sleep, your ideal goal would to get yourself off all the kinds of psychostimulants and stimulants. That means... You can't be taking cocaine. You can't be taking, you know, all of these other stimulants that we keep you with. Also, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate in the late afternoon is a disaster for sleep because it has a lot of caffeine in it. That means teas. I mean, just 
read the labels. All those those energy drinks are like the enemy of sleep. So that's one. The other second one that we all do maybe too much of is if you have a drink, if you have a glass of, after 6 p.m., if you have alcohol, it will still be in your brain. Now, it doesn't make it so you can't fall asleep. Caffeine makes it so you can't fall asleep very well. But alcohol makes it so, okay, you fall asleep, but two or three hours later, you wake up. Mm -hmm. So if you're the kind of person who's waking up after a few hours, not able to go back to sleep and, you know, having that, that which is just disaster, the, the hosing, the hosing out of those, those trash is not going to happen if you're waking up in the middle of the night for, you know, a bit period of time. You So, uh, so what I recommend is if you want to have a glass of wine or something, dinner, that you have sort of an earliest side dinner around, you know, 6 p.m. or so if you're going to be going to bed by 11. So just really modify that. If you're and if you're really waking up in the middle of the night a lot and you really want to be brave, just try to skip the alcohol altogether for a couple of weeks and see if your sleep improves. So those are just two tips that I know I give a whole bunch of others about you know, exercising in sunlight because the first thing in the morning, I mean, this time of year, it's summertime. So it doesn't make a lot of difference. We usually get a lot of bright light in the early morning. But in the wintertime, like if you could see my setup right here is my computer. And right above my computer, I have a, a full spectrum light. And I don't turn it on in the summertime usually. But in the in the wintertime, I, first thing in the morning, if it's not, there's no sun outside, I'll just click the, the full spectrum light. And these are not very expensive. They're pretty cheap. These They're quite inexpensive. But you can get even just the little small ones. But if you get 10 to 20 minutes, I mean, even just do 10, as soon as you get up, you could just put that bright spectrum right in the bathroom when you're brushing your teeth or whatever, you're or getting ready for the day, something like that. It's it's an extra little step. But that important thing to remember, the reason the bright light's important is that it's as if it's pushing the reset 24-hour button in your brain. Mm -hmm. It pushes the reset button for the next 24 hours. So it basically controls like the melatonin, the thing that's going to cause you to be able to have a wake time, a wake time during the day and then be able to sleep at night. So those are just three tips that I know I give you about six or seven or eight more, you know, down here in, in that in page 86 and 87. So those are just tips. And your brain, if you have a clean brain, even if you're going through the transition and into the upgrade, it will really help your transition. The issue, of course, of hot flash. Are you having hot flashes, Harry, too? Do you know what? I'm really lucky in that that has not been a problem for me. No. Bravo. That's great. Because the women that do, because they wake up in the middle of the night with their drenched, their, their, their pajamas or their sheets are drenched and they're up and they're changing and, you know, that's messing up your sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and just to tell you why, it's the cool thing about what's going on in your brain, we have a thermostat in our brain. And... If you're in a room with a bunch of other people and someone changes the temperature abruptly upwards 10 degrees, right? It's like all of a sudden everybody's hot, right? Everybody's taking off layers. Everybody's hot or opening windows or whatever. For the woman in this, in the transition in the perimenopause slash up in this 10 years, your estrogen changes have messed up the thermostat in your brain so that if someone changes the temperature in the room by one or two degrees, Everybody, I'm not. I'm not transitioning. I'm talk, talking Fahrenheit. So excuse me. I'm sorry, but oh, anyway, no, if they change it a little bit, nobody else, nobody else will be hot, but you will be sweating because the estrogen changes have changed the thermostat setting in your brain to measure only one or two degrees as being hot and something worthy of sweating about. So that's what happens. I mean, you just you know the layers and the cool and the you know just all of that. Those are the women who come to me and really need to be the ones who are really that's messing up their sleep and their daytime and everything. They they can really benefit from estrogen estrogen supplements during this period of time to reset the thermostat and they'll they'll stop sweating all the time. Throughout your book, you mention HRT and have all your wonderful tools that you discuss. Where do you stand broadly on HRT? Because again, the question that comes up again and again and again is either should I take HRT or am I missing out if I don't? Right. So um, remember that the 20 year anniversary of the Women's Health Initiative study where they took everybody off of it 20 mm -hmm. years ago. And so many, so many of my peers did, unfortunately didn't get access to it, even though that lots of them needed it. So one of the things we've learned is that study was very messed up. 
and you know the issue about breast cancer if you have the breast cancer gene yourself you shouldn't take hrt so let's just get that out of the way right off the top of the bat but otherwise you can take estrogen for for at least 10 years with, without um any problem that has to do with with increased breast cancer so that should be just that's kind of where all of the um, experts are at this point in time so let me tell you why you might consider taking or not taking it and um it's so wonderful. You know, if you go on the Na the North American uh, Medical Menopause Society, the NAMS website, you can find a NAMS trained doctor slash nurse practitioner, someone in your area that will help you with this. They they know what I'm talking about. Other doctors, remember, the OBGYNs, the gynecologists, at least in, at least in the United States, I know that mostly in other countries, it's your, their GPs that are doing it, their, their general practitioners are doing it. But anyway, in the United States, the people who are supposed to be the experts, the OBGYNs are supposed to be the experts in the HRT, 20% of them only have even had one lecture during their residency about HRT and menopause. It's just like, you know, they're mostly focused on pregnancies, high-risk pregnancies, fertility, you know. So, but anyway, they, because of this study, they basically, everybody just stopped using it. It went from like 35% of women who were on it in 2002 when the study came out, and two years later, like 5% were on it. So it's like, it just like fell off the cliff. So mm -hmm. I just, which, which is something that's a naturalistic, what we call in our business, it was a naturalistic study because all of those women who haven't had it for 20 years are now showing up with the diseases that could have been treated by it, having HRT. For example, osteoporosis. You know, if you if you get your bone density scan, which most NAMS, the, the, the North American Menopause Society um, doctors will give you a bone scan, which is so easy. You just lay down on this, you just lay down on this bed and they push a button, this thing goes right over you and you're done. So it's like, it's not, a, it's not a big deal. It's a very easy one to do and they measure your bone density of your spine and your and your hips. So you get a score that says you are below normal, you're normal or you're above normal. I just had mine done recently and mine is it's like what's called one mine is one standard deviation above a healthy 35 year old. I've been taking estrogen for all those years. And so it all, you know, it's what your genetics are, but it's also the, estrogen is one of the best formers of bone that we know. It's the only, it's the only thing that really makes bone lay down. So I think if you're, if you're in that category, mostly it's, it's thin white women who smoke it used to be the thing in medicine, thin white women who smoke are like losing their bones like crazy. If you're an athlete and you're very thin, you know, you're very, very thin, your bones may be getting very brittle. So I just give that as one example for why someone might really want to think about it for themselves or, you know, or for their, you know, for their loved ones to be able to take it. The issue of, you know, women have more Alzheimer's. And I talk about that in chapter 14. I talk a lot about just kind of like what's known about that and why, what HRT may or may not do. I mean, estrogen doesn't cure Alzheimer's once you have it. But the idea is that it may strengthen aspects of our brain circuits while we're younger that will do some aspect of prevention. Obviously, if you're from a family that has genetic Alzheimer's thing where you get it very early, like in your 40s, that this estrogen's not going to do anything for you. But the idea that it might be preventative, there's a whole area of thought, no proof yet, that that taking estrogen during between the ages of like 45 and 60 will help decrease your incidence of getting dementia. Finally then, Luann, why are the upgrade years the best of your life? Just think about having PMS every day during your 40s and then all of a sudden here you have this clarity because you know how we were talking about how the, the hormones during your fertility cycle, they, they build up circuits and they tear them down. They build up. It's almost like walking on a little path along the shoreline where the tide comes in and washes them away and then it goes out and they build up and it comes in and washes them away. But now... In the upgrade, you're walking on a path that's a little higher up the hill, and this the tide isn't coming and washing. You're just standing on firmer ground. You can see further. You're not losing blood every month. You're just in a healthier, clearer state of mind that's not being torn down and built up, torn down and built up every month. So that's one of the reasons that the upgrade, in terms of the brain structure, gives us such stability 
and then there are also lots of sociological things too, right? Because usually as we hit the upgrade years between the ages of, let's say, let's say 50 and 60, most people's kids are going to be living home to go whatever, do whatever. And our dance card is going to be like, has some new slots in it and our in our creativity our ability to re-envision ourselves and what what is our path and it's basically coming back more and more to being able to be the authentic you i mean you know being able to be true to yourself i think is something all of us women are so hungry for and especially by the time you hit the upgrade years you haven't been like you say you haven't been prioritizing yourself your creativity, all kinds of things in your life that you wanted to do, you know, maybe have been put on the back burner and you thought that they would never come back around again ever. But, you know, like in the United States, it's over over half of the new businesses that are started are being started more than half by women uh, over the age of 50. So, you know, I, it's so funny because the women in their 30s are some of the ones that are just like devouring this book because it's they're so excited. They think like, it's not all over when you're 40. We're all thinking it's all, you know, that we're all, it's not all over. No, it's not. And the nice thing is, is that, you know, mother nature, you know, when you're out there, like you're, you're having to look a certain way, you're having to be like, you know, pretty and sexy. And like, you know, you're just trying to catch a mate, catch the best, catch the best sperm as mother mm-hmm. nature wants you to do and procreate and all, that. you know, those, that's a, that's a developmental stage of our life, but that is the one that's going to be behind us now in the rear view mirror. And we have this whole second half of our life to um, expand into and think about and imagine what direction we wanted to go. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is I wanted to give that message to you younger women that it's it's a really exciting thing to time to imagine and to think of like just you, just you being you, just you being you at your most authentic, truest self is what's in front of you. It is truly the most positive thing I have read and I've fully embraced your vocabulary of the transition and the upgrade and friends are catching on as well. Thank you so much for your time. It has truly been such a pleasure to talk to you and to meet you. All right, honey. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Take care. Take good care. Self-care, self-care, self-care. You can find Luanne on her website, luannebrizendine.com and on Instagram at luannebrizendine. And I really do urge you to read The Upgrade. It is relatable, fascinating, informative, and so useful and available in all the usual places. Follow us on the podcast apps, click subscribe, and please leave a review. Every little bit makes a difference. And remember to share, share, share. The more people we reach, the more we will change and modernize the face of menopause. Thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. 